morning. Um, and we're recording now. So thank you for coming. My name is Kathy Baker Eclipse. I'm a landscape architect and the project manager for in the Boston Parks Department. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so, and it will be available on the website within a week. Uh, so please share that link with any friends and neighbors that you know that were unable to join us tonight. Um, our cameras are on, yours are off. So, um, so just be aware of that when uh, we do go to a, a public uh, comment period that uh, we won't be able to see you, but we'll be able to hear you. Uh, you can also, if you have questions uh, that we can answer during the, that come up during the meeting that you don't wanna forget, uh, you can put them in the Q&A box down at the bottom as well. Uh, I do wanna thank you all for coming on this historic day when we welcomed our new mayor uh, uh, in her new position uh, as mayor. Um, this meeting is going to be a different style of community meeting than we've done past years. Um, it will be an online presentation and discussion hosted by the Parks Department and, and facilitated also through the uh, Parks Design team of Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. We certainly are seeing everyone's faces and hope that we can uh, take these lessons that we've learned and roll them into um, to us as our community meetings continue to evolve, evolve from this, this period of learning. I'm really pleased to see uh, so much enthusiasm from the community. Um, we've received great feedback as we've gone through these processes uh, and it's been really helpful for our, to help in our design thinking. Um, it's great to see that the neighborhood loves the park and uh, continues to wanna make improvements in the neighborhood. Can we move to the next slide? So as I said, this is a Zoom webinar. You can raise your hand during uh, the Q&A period and we will uh, unmute your mic uh, and you can, you can speak your comment during that, during that period. Or you can use the Q&A box to put, uh, to put some thoughts down if, uh, if you don't wanna lose your train of thought. And we'll, we'll also be reading those and answering those during the Q&A. To the lower uh, right hand corner is the um, is the leave button if you need to, to exit. Um, and I don't think we have anybody on the phone at the moment, but if and when we do, we'll, I will prioritize our callers on the phone uh, so that they can um, they can ask their questions as well. Can we have the next slide. So we don't have interpretation tonight. I did not receive any requests for interpretation, but uh, if you know of someone in the neighborhood who, uh, who is interested in this project and language is a barrier for them, please share with them that um, we can provide translations upon request at no cost to them so that they can access the material that we're presenting. We do not want to let, um, to let let those in our community who are um, who for whom language is a barrier be unable to participate in our process, and we feel strongly that every voice is important for us to hear and consider as we move forward. Uh, so tonight we're going to be um, going through introducing reintroducing ourselves in many cases uh, to the project team. Talk about the timeline and the funding review the recommendations of this comprehensive plan, discussing that those recommendations and then talking about next steps. I do wanna introduce the project team. My, again, my name is Kathy Baker Eclipse. I'm the project manager for this, this work. Uh, Christine Brandeo is our outreach coordinator. She's helping us uh, moderate the comments that come in tonight and we wanna thank her for being here tonight. She also supports ongoing volunteer efforts in parks, coordinates park programs, and is a point of contact for people long after the park improvements are over. So she's a great resource in the community for, for not just this site, but if there's other sites that you're aware of and friends groups, um, she's a great asset and resource for the community. I also wanna introduce Kyle Zick, principal from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture, and Danielle, Danielle Desolets, also from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. So thanks for coming here tonight. Um, I'm not sure I saw Connor's name. I don't think Connor's in the, in the audience yet, but uh, he may be joining us later. He's a great resource for, uh, for some of the broader neighborhood issues that may or may not be park specific. Uh, so 
keep that contact info uh, handy. You can also reach him through 311 if there are issues. Uh, I think I saw that there are a couple of uh, representatives from elected officials in the audience, and I want to allow them to uh, to be acknowledged and make any comments that they they want uh, or may want to make. Uh, Jen Migliori from Rep Moran's office is here, um, and also um, Pam Mullaney, Mullaney from. Uh, from Council Breeden's office is also here. So if you would like to say a, a word or two, please raise your hand and I can, we can unmute you. All right, um, I think that's, just let us know if, uh, if something comes up and you'd like to say something. Um, so when we consider park improvements, Wait, we're incorporating- Connor wanted us to know that he's here. Uh, I'm sorry, who? Connor. Oh, Connor, hi, Connor, thanks for joining us. Um, when we consider the park design, we're considering a lot of different priorities. We have the city of Boston priorities uh, that we're looking at. We also have uh, safety guidelines and regulatory guidelines to incorporate into our design thinking. Parks and recreation goals are also part of that park design uh, process and also community input. So we take all of these ideas and bring them together and hopefully are creating a really successful and, uh, and exciting park future for the community. Some of those city of Boston priorities are expanding walkable access to parks. Uh, we were the first city on the East Coast to have a park within a 10 minute walk of every resident and we're really proud of that fact. Uh, we also wanna address equity uh, and providing open space to all of our residents in a fair and equitable manner. More and more we're seeing climate resilience is a really important factor as, as we're uh, building our parks and being able to plan for their future use uh, in, as, as the climate evolves. Promoting health through our open space recreational offerings and also creating places in nature that people can be and, and, uh, and reconnect with themselves in a healthy manner and also community building uh, through our community process. More in depth on some of those parks and recreation goals, we wanna have accessible and open space that's accessible and available to all that provides a diverse, balanced and efficient mix of uses, trying to make as many spaces uh, multifunctional as we can so that we can provide uh, a broader offering of, of uh, program uses. We wanna make sure that we have a meaningful and inclusive and community engagement and uh, we're hoping that we can incorporate some of these lessons that we've learned into that moving forward and also provide adaptive and resilient landscapes for our changing climate and promote connections both inter between the neighborhood and, and within neighbors themselves. So we are here in March, uh, towards the end of this project timeline. Uh, we've had a meeting in October, a second meeting in January, and we've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work to prepare this, this uh, presentation. So we'll be wrapping up the comprehensive plan this spring and moving forward with its recommendations, hopefully in pretty quick order. Um, but uh, so the next steps are, yet determined in terms of their uh, finality, but we're hoping that we can move into uh, implementing phase one in pretty short order, but uh, we'll have to see how things shake out uh, citywide as well. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle and Kyle at this point and let, let them walk you through the goals and the, uh, and the presentation. Thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kathy. I'll start us off, but you'll hear from both Danielle and I as we walk through some of the recommendations. Um, the feedback we've gotten from you all, from the community, um, we've tried to, we think we can categorize different ways. There's accessibility improvements, addressing safety concerns, ease of maintenance and placemaking. And we'll explain these as we go. Um, and there's certainly more than just these broad topics, but that's how we distill these in and, and it's also how you think of them in terms of priorities you know safety and accessibility are first and then we start to go beyond kind of those things that are um, must-haves so just to orient you you all know this place very well 
Um, this is just a plan view of the park. Um, and just for orientation, you have the Little League baseball field, the courts, West End House, playground, the woodland area. And that's the Jackson Mann School here. So this says the proposed site plan. And this doesn't have a lot of labels on it yet. We'll get into all the different things proposed. But I, just, I think the thing I wanted to highlight is that it's a comprehensive plan. What we've heard from you is there's not a need to transform this park and change it dramatically. It's improve a lot of the things that already exist, make the pathways better, make the drainage better, improve maintenance, make it safer, but not let's change all kinds of things around. So that's one thing we heard. The other thing I wanna kind of preface as we dive into this is a comprehensive plan is a long range plan. It's not something that we're gonna to implement tomorrow or next year. Some of these recommendations could be in the next year or two, three, but some of them may be 10, 15 years away, but you'll help us tonight by giving us feedback to say, yeah, we still wanna do that, but we don't, we're not in any rush to do that. And we can help reaffirm that and say, yeah, there's, that can wait, that can be deferred. Well, these other things really need to happen sooner. So the first thing I'll start off with is the walkways. And this has to do with safety, has to do with drainage, and it has to do with accessibility. And the highlight is that we really want to make sure that that through pathway is consistent, safe, and accessible. And that starts with the entrance at Alston Street to um, remove the bollard the, and the cobblestones. I'll also have another slide later where we show that we actually shift this walkway some to provide a little more buffer to the abutter. Um, and then otherwise this walkway would be repaired or actually replaced to be a consistent width from one end to the next so that you can walk side by side. If a bike goes on it, it doesn't cause people to have to walk off to the edge and also so that maintenance vehicles can use it to access parts of the park. We also know that you told us that in the winter, this portion of the path and other portions of the path where water is basically coming down the hill, freezing and icing over the path is a concern. So we can address that with swales and drainage structures. So that's something that would be linked to the path improvements. Down on the um, Gordon Street end, there's a faint double line here that is where the path is today. You all know that that goes steeply uphill and then stays at a higher elevation. That grade's too steep to be universally accessible. So we're actually suggesting moving the entrance some and following the lower elevation, which a lot of people do anyway. You can see the wear marks in the lawn and making sure that that path is accessible everywhere then. The other thing to do would be to formalize and pave the gravel walkway along the outfield of the Little League infield, or the Little League field, because that makes it accessible, can improve the drainage problems, and then also do some work to the paths in the woodlands. As a byproduct, and part of the reason we want to improve that main spine is that it helps out with maintenance access. The black dashed line is where Boston Parks maintenance vehicles can access the park now. We've met with parks maintenance staff and they said it's a, it's a limiting factor. They come in on Webley, go beyond the outfield and they can get to this gathering space at the courts and turn around and leave or they can go all toward Alston Street and they can get up to the top of the hill but they can't go to Gordon Street because it's too tight um, next to the courts and the woodlands are not really um, accessible either. So that affects them mowing the lawns, it affects them emptying trash cans, it affects doing tree work. So by improving the path system, we can go beyond this dashed black line and get maintenance access to all the places of the black line and the orange line. And that will help with maintenance greatly because they'll be able to access those areas. Then we, we've talked some about vegetation management. And um, so there's a lot of different aspects of this. So think of the different types of vegetation that are on site. And we'll start with the one we've labeled as number one. There's high intensity turf on a baseball field. But then you think about the walkways, how they're aligned with trees. And that's part of the experience. They're 
fairly mature trees to provide shade and spatial definition. There's also wooded buffers, the ones labeled three, that provide some separation and privacy for the residences or the abutters. Number six is the woodland. Everyone, a lot of people have commented how they love the woodland. It's a great contrast from the rest of the park and it's like an escape within the city. A couple things we heard from the community that are a little different. On the slope, there's an opportunity to increase the diversity of the plant species. And this is a citywide goal, but something, you know, is a goal for Alston as well. Can we introduce some pollinator species here shown in area four on the slope adjacent to the primary path? And further up the hill, could it be a taller grass that has mown paths and that could have native grass species as well? We have a few images here suggesting, you know, a pollinator meadow is one that has wildflowers in it. And it's promoting native bees, insects, butterflies um, that do pollinating work, as the name implies. And then the tall grass would have mown paths that are wide enough so that you're not getting, you're not brushing up against tall grass, but the tall grass again is habitat um, and a chance to have a more diverse plant species within this park. The woodlands are kind of their own separate project in a lot of ways because it's a different kind of landscape that requires different management and maintenance. And there are a lot of concerns there in things that need to be improved. There's prevalent erosion, there's safety and security concerns, there's a constant battle with litter and graffiti, and then just the management of the vegetation, hazard tree removal, pruning, invasive species management, and protection of vegetation. So some of the recommendations there are, um, we start kind of going through them numerically. If we change this pathway and take the lower ground to make it accessible, the woodland paths need to be extended, suggested with those blue arrows to connect that to that path system. There's also a number of paths in the woodlands that are too steep and they're constantly eroding and will continue to erode. So there's different things we can do there. Um, some are like here and here are redundant and other paths take you to the same place. Same thing here, we have a path and a path right next to each other. So the ones labeled as number two, we would recommend closing and revegetating and fencing those off temporarily while the vegetation can get reestablished. And then the steepest paths with these kind of purple symbols are um, desire lines. People wanna go there, but they're very steep. So we could add either wood or stone water bars and think of them as steps, but that's a way to minimize erosion and be able to direct stormwater off of the trail surface and manage it purposefully. As that water comes downhill, it's gonna be heading toward the main path that goes from Gordon to Alston Street. And we can capture and infiltrate a lot of that stormwater. And actually that's a nice advantage to be able to have some unique um, plant zones that would have a little bit more moisture. And then improve this path. It, we say hardened, that could be paved, it could be a crushed stone surface, but that's an improvement over the bark mulch or the wood chips that have um, been placed down over the recent years, because generally they hold on to moisture and they're, they're not a durable material. Then we'll talk about lighting. So this plan is a proposed plan, but I'll, I need to orient you a bit. It's the same way the plan has been oriented everywhere else. The Jackson Man School is here. West End House is here. This is the Little League field. These are the courts. That's the main pathway. Then you have Alston Street and Gordon Street. So most of these symbols, these yellow circles are existing lights. So no change there. <clears throat> these smaller faint yellow lights are the pylons that will be installed very soon. This is the project that was, um, it has um, white pylons along the paths, but also some at some of the entrances and they're solar powered. Other lights shown on the West End house are existing and the small red dots are security cameras that exist. The emergency telephone exists. So what's different? Anything shown with that, that orange halo is a new light fixture. There's three light fixtures here that are new because they follow that realignment of the path. And there's a question we have for you is, should we have lighting on that path through the woodlands to go from Gordon Street to Alston Street? And we've debated this a bit. You know, does that 
make you want to use that path because the path, the lighting makes you feel safer. You can see where you're going. You can see people um, beyond the path. Or do you think it's a false sense of security and the dark woodlands not far off the lit path would be an issue? The other thing to point out is we say upgrade the court lights with LED lights, adding shields and program timing. And this is where I'll go back to my comment about these plans are long range plans. So this could be something that if the community decides is something that's desired could be done 10, 15, 20 years from now. But we at least wanna make people aware that the technology exists to improve the control of the lighting versus what's out there now. What's out there now, which is what we've heard has been an issue with glare, is a light fixture here pointing right at the neighbors and a light fixture here and here pointing this way. There's a, so there's a lot of light pollution. New fixtures are, we're able to control much better. So we just wanna show that that's an option if the community wants that in the future. Then I'm gonna let Danielle talk more about some of the gathering spaces and placemaking. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so one of the, the um, <clears throat> getting principles that Kyle talked about at the very beginning was placemaking. Um, so we have this performance space um, that's permitted as a performance space now um, that's located just off the Ermey Avenue um, uh, intersection. It, it's essentially, it's kind of the center of the park, um, but we really feel like it could become the um, kind of the ceremonial heart of the park, um, like it was probably originally intended. Um, it's, it's used, we've seen it in action on Saturday morning um, and some other days of the week. And so we've seen how, um, you know, the lawn isn't in great shape anymore, but there's some great trees that are there. And so we think that we can do a little um, updating to, <clears throat> to add some more character, some more of the, the, the unique qualities that are also into the space to really make it a space that you want to use and that can continue to be permitted. Um, so you go to the next slide, please, Kyle. And I think um, if you joined us at the meeting um, number two, the meeting back in January, you might have seen these slides as well. Um, but the, we have two options here. Essentially, they look at balancing um, some lawn space with more of a hardscape area that could be a performance space. Um, so that it puts a little less of the pressure on the lawn area. Um, we heard pretty clearly that um, additional seating is critical um, throughout the park, but especially in this area as it is kind of that central space. And we really wanna make this um, a community gathering space. So the two options look at doing that. Um, there's a sketch here. This is, again, they, they are not a, an overhaul of the spaces and of the space that's there, but just um, updating it and adding some of those critical elements, improving the walkways, um, as Kyle mentioned, adding more seating and adding more um, better connections to some of the other spaces around them. And the next slide, I think we have a um, modeling of that park. So you can see the playground is up towards the up towards the top with the stairs and the tennis and basketball courts off to the right and the Army Street entrance down towards the bottom of the slide. So it essentially <clears throat> still provides the same sort of um, of space that's there, but by by adding some hardscape into that area takes um, some of the pressure off the the wear and tear off the turf that's in there now. Um, and trying to maintain as much as we can some of those existing trees because those um, because there's alcovas, but they are um, adding valuable shade and and habitat um, and canopy to the park. Um, so just another <coughs> excuse me, another image of that um, park. Uh, uh, sorry, give me get the gathering space, and then we have the other option, I believe. A couple more images. Just moving around the space, so you can see how it interacts with the other. Um, this would be from the Army Street. So this is the other alternative that um, we've used, and so we can look at using some um, more rustic. And this one shows a little bit more rustic elements. Um, incorporating some stone into the site, but again, trying to um, <clears throat> give some edges to the spaces that are there and add some additional um, seating, formalize those spaces a little bit more. So if you just want to, <clears throat> thank you. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> uh, 
I think you just want to scroll through those, Kyle. And you can see from the images from, again, the same perspective for each site from the playground, looking towards the playground, um, tennis and, <clears throat> and basketball courts on your side and your right side. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so then one of the other things we looked at um, was the edges of the park as well as the entrances. Um, and part of the study when we did, <clears throat> excuse me, we had the survey prepared was to look at the property boundaries as well. Um, <clears throat> so in this diagram, you can see again, same layout that you've seen elsewhere, um, the Jackson Man School up at the top of the slide. There's a number of different um, lines here. So the blue lines are existing um, chain link fence that are on park property, um, as we currently understand the property boundaries. So <clears throat> again, in the long range plan, we might look at <clears throat> so sorry, look at replacing some of those um, fences along the way and creating a more definitive um, park edge. The, the red dashed area, those are the existing stone walls um, that are there. And then the green um, uh, towards the bottom, that is chain link fence also, but that is private side that's um, behind the Calm Ave residences. And then there's a short segment of another um, so that's a concrete wall that's also on private. So we're just kind of understanding the current edges and I think how we might um, <clears throat> kind of redefine those, those edges. So more than likely over time, replacing those chain link fences, improving the, the, the entrances that we'll get into in a moment. Um, but then I think there is a, we're trying to maintain the pedestrian um, gateway that's at the Column Ave entrance against the, those, that wall and that fence that are there are not on park property. Um, and then we'll look at <clears throat> into more detail, I apologize, and for the gateways where we're adjusting walls, adjusting gateways, um, and kind of reconfiguring some of those entrances. So you can go to the next slide, please, Kyle. So this is the Webley Street that Kyle mentioned adjacent to the, the, to the school. So one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that these gateways have a consistent design language. So, you know, you have that, that really strong wall on the Alston Street side. We're going to incorporate in the, in the Gordon Street, <clears throat> incorporate that into the other um, gateway. So you have a distinctive element. So, you know, this is park property um, and that you're within your rights to walk around this property and to enjoy it. Um, so one of the things that Kyle also talks about ease of maintenance. So these are one of the, one of the areas where we talked about formalizing the pathway um, so that maintenance vehicles can use it, but also providing vehicular gates and appropriate locations that um, parks staff can use when they need to get in to maintain. Um, and then kind of adding some of these, <clears throat> the pier details that are that are seen other places in the, in the park, like I said, along Alston Street. So redefining the gateway to make it a really pronounced statement, getting rid of some of the other visual clutter that's probably not functioning the way it was originally intended to, like the bollards um, that are along some of those entrances now. And then also there's the, the lighting and pylon project that um, may be being installed relatively soon. Um, so we're showing that at some of the, the entrances as well where that is <coughs> connects to the, to the, the <coughs> excuse me, to the gateways. Um, next, please, Kyle. <coughs> So this is <clears throat> Emory Road. We are just talking about the, the placemaking space, the kind of the heart of the, the park, the central core. Um, again, removing some of the visual clutter of the bollards that are there. This is a dead end street. Um, so redefining the park identity um, with signage, adding those um, a low wall into that area. Um, picking up on the detail that we talked about elsewhere and some of those piers. And then you, again, behind you, you see there's a pylon that's to be located in that area. And again, improving some of the, the sidewalk access. And because this is in a, a place, if we can provide um, vehicular access in other locations, this is an, a, a point where uh, maintenance vehicles would need access, so no vehicular gate at this point. So this is strictly pedestrian entrance. <clears throat> So this is on the, around the corner of Gordon Street. <clears throat> um, so where we do here, we talk, Kyle talks about relocating that pathway instead of going over the mound, but to go kind of around it where it already is to make sure that it's a fully accessible pathway. So instead of 
just having the pathway reconnect to where it currently is in terms of that yellow connection moving the moving the gateway itself um, and also providing a, a crosswalk at that point so you have a safe accessible um, crossing across Gordon Street relocating um, street lights as appropriate to make sure that they're not um, that they're lighting the pathway as we need them to be and this would be another point you see a vehicular gate here so we're making sure that parks has access to that point as well and then the, uh, another one of the pylons would be located there, the light pylons. So this is the, um, the kind of the corner of the park um, at the edge of the, the woodland um, along Austin Street in the corner. There is currently that single pier at this gateway now. Um, the, and as I mentioned, that chain link fence is on park property. So that's something else that we would probably look at. Um, so removing the existing bollard that's there, providing a um, secure vehicular gate so that maintenance can, in, can get in and get out and only the vehicles that need to get in can go in, but also making sure that we have um, appropriate spacing between the vehicular gate and the pier so that pedestrians and people on um, bikes or people in wheelchairs with strollers can all get in there and we're meeting the codes as we want to. Um, and then another pylon at this location. So shortening, shortening the wall on one side, but adding a pier on both to again, recreate that gateway that we've seen elsewhere. Next slide. So um, Allison Street, so this is kind of the, one of the main entrances of the park and Kyle alluded to this earlier. So again, this we have the wall detail, a portion of it has been rebuilt um, in the past, um, but again, <clears throat> because the, where the existing pathway comes in, it is so tight to that residence that's there. If we can shift that pathway over, provide a little bit of buffer, a little bit of screening, and a little more, um, just some room to breathe between the residence that's there and people coming and going in and out of the park. So shifting that gateway over, adjusting the crosswalk appropriately, um, making sure that the curb ramps um, meet ADA requirements, um, and then adjusting the lighting as well in the gates so that everything syncs up. And again, then we have a really consistent language um, throughout all the entrances of the park. So that I'll let Kyle pick back up on the play area. All right, thanks, Danielle. So on the playground, <clears throat> I think what we've heard from you all is that it's generally right-sized you know, it has good separation between the different age groups. It's used by a lot of different groups from neighbors to the West End House to the Jackson Man School. Um, but it doesn't need to be re-envisioned. It just needs to be redone because the, the surfacing and the equipment are tired and out of date and it's due for a renovation. So what we're showing is a renovated playground within the confines of the playground that exists. And a lot of the components are similar. There's still a splash pad in a central location. There's the smaller kids, age two to five equipment that's separated, but still within the same space from five to 12 equipment with new trees planted with more soil and growing space. We have seating in shade in those locations, but otherwise, you know, it's a fenced in space that has an accessible route and multiple entrances. So it's very similar. Um, as, and the other thing to highlight, you know, with this being a comprehensive plan is that, you know, this is something that's needed um, because of the equipment and surfacing and their age and condition, but there's a, a greater design process that will happen if this becomes a priority and is funded. So we don't have to stress about what is this equipment yet and how many swings and how many slides there are, but the goals we do want to confirm, you know, that it's suitable for the public use and for school use. And then ultimately we'd love to get more input from the schools um, and particularly if the Jackson Man is going to be renovated or replaced, we're gonna address the accessibility issues and that we do feel that the, there should be inclusive play as part of this um, in general, but also for the school use. In past meetings, we've talked about a fitness circuit and we've heard from the community that um, there's a desire for this and the park is used a lot of different ways from a fitness standpoint. You know, we've seen people use the playground equipment that way or running up and down the hills or 
using, uh, you know, walking around the park. So we wanted to formalize this a bit and suggest that within the, the inside of this park, there's actually a lot of opportunity for a fitness trail. And to highlight that, there could be some fixed equipment, pull-up bars, push-up bars, sit-up stations spread throughout this trail that people could use. And that would unite and cause people to use the more active part of the park, extend into the woodland, go up the hill, and um, engage with all aspects of the park. Also wanted to talk about the Little League Field and Dog Park. Um, and they're not... Um, tied together, but we heard at the first meeting, the drop-in session and the second meeting, quite a bit about the, uh, com the dog community, dog owner community, and that the Little League field basically is used as an informal dog park. And there's pros and cons to that. Um, of course, if the, dog if the Little League field is being used by dog owners, it's a it's, um, people feel like they can't use the baseball field. And there was concern about safety and that kind of thing, but also this is a strong dog community and there's a desire to have a space for dogs and dogs owner, dog owners. We showed a lot of different locations for potential dog parks within the site. Um, not all of them you know, fit all the criteria we'd like. We don't wanna, we wanna have a minimum of 5,000 square feet um, to be what we have seen has been successful in the area. Um, we don't want to be too close to abutters, residential abutters, because of noise and, you know, that kind of how often they're used and the duration they're used, dog parks are used during the day. So the best location we feel is near the backstop of the Little League field, centrally located, good access um, from Alston Street. And it's also a location that works with Little League in its current configuration, or if in the future, it was decided that Little League wasn't the best use of the, wasn't the best athletic use. And if it were converted to a small soccer field, the dog park could remain and no one infrastructure really needs to change. So that's something to consider. Now, if that field use were to change, there's an opportunity to also adjust the paths. Um, right now, you know, paths kind of hug the arc of the outfield with a multi-use field here that could be similar, but also things can kind of cut in a little bit more. But there's also extra space that can be informal play or warm up or practice space. So um, those are the number of recommendations we wanted to walk through. I did want to talk about priorities a bit. And you know, we've taken a stab at what short-term um, improvements would be and what longer term may be. The thing to realize with this is a lot of this depends, and this is a discussion separate from funding because nothing is funded for construction at this time. And you know the money for this could come um, at different times or from different sources. And Kathy can talk more about that in terms of capital funding or grants and that kind of thing. But in terms of short-term improvements, we feel like the safety and accessibility issues are really a priority. So that's the new pavement, the new walks, and with that you tie the drainage, lighting, and some of the entrance work. Also, you would probably tie some of the tree work, but tree work can be kind of its own thing as well because there's dead trees to remove, there's a lot of pruning to do. The play area renovation is certainly um, something that's needed, and then formalizing that dog park outside of the Little League field. Longer term, the woodland trail improvements, the field renovation itself, and that's a decision. I mean, you could just re renovate the field as it is, or it's also the time to really think, is the Little League baseball field what we want here? And it probably makes sense to be in tune with what the Jackson Mann School is planning um, for their future, because that may have an impact on it. Some of the gathering space improvements that Danielle described um, are a little bit longer term, and then the court lighting would be longer term as well. So we covered a bit of ground. Thank you all for being so patient and listening. Um, I'll leave up a site plan that shows the overall park and we'd be happy to take your comments and uh, continue the discussion. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks, Danielle. Thanks for struggling through that with 
Um, I see there are some comments in the Q&A and we'll go through those as well. Um, and so we can start there. And if you, a reminder, if you have a question that you'd like to, to ask, uh, ask yourself rather than have me read it, you can raise your hand and we will prioritize uh, that. I think it goes in, in priority order. Um, so just uh, work with us as we struggle through here. There are a couple of, of uh, quick questions and I think ones that, um, that we address later on about um, a discussion about the Jackson Man School um, eventually working through their own design process. And that is, um, that is something that we're in, we've coordinated with BPS. We're aware that they have a longer term plan for the Jackson Man. And that's why we kind of held off on some of those um, the improvements that directly impact that property line because they're gonna, that whole edge could change in some way as they work through um, work through their, their design process. Entrances might change, um, you know, how one, how the school accesses the park might, might differ from what it is today. So we just kind of thought that that was better left as a longer term goal, but reconsidering that, that field use is, uh, is one of the, one of the thoughts that we have for the master plan. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Morgan. I think I, I this is like the worst mouse ever. Um, and it looks like you should have the ability to unmute yourself. So Morgan, why don't you go ahead? Hi, um, am I unmuted? Yes. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I had sort of two related issues which seemed like they weren't very addressed today. Um, and they're both about the hill leading from the ball field up to the West End house. So traditionally that's always been an area that people um, went to socialize outdoors and over the summer with the COVID indoor restrictions, it was extremely used by the community to the point where I, you know, we would joke that you'd need like a reservation to even find a sort of space to sit where you'd be isolated from other people. So basically the whole hill would be kind of full of people with picnic blankets or on their own just reading. Um, so I'd be a bit concerned that uh, the plan which mentioned letting that area go to tall grass and paths would make it a bit difficult to socialize outdoors safely both in terms of the visibility and the potential for uh, ticks and so on and then relatedly um, I've gone up there and cleaned that area of trash several times and it's um it's a lot and I wonder would it be possible to put trash cans up there I feel like that might streamline that process it does seem like the park Someone cleans it on an organized basis, it seems like, but I've definitely gone there and spent, you know, had several people and we spent an entire morning cleaning and not really even covered half of it. So there's definitely a need for that as well. I guess that's all, all I was concerned about. Yeah, it's definitely, um, access for us is challenging from a maintenance perspective, it's challenging for us to get up there. So that's, um, so, I can I can talk to the maintenance department about whether it makes sense to add um, add barrels up there, but my fear is that it would just be places that would be accumulated uh, before we would be able to regularly uh, remove them. But I can I can speak to them about that. Um, I think Marta H also has a comment in the Q and A about why there's a choice for tall grass on the hill while so many people like to put their blankets down. So I think she's reiterating what you had said. Um, even early this week, around the end of the afternoon, the hill was dotted with neighbors enjoying the lovely weather uh, with tall grass that would not be possible or do I misunderstand the placement? And I think, Marta, I think you're right that um, that, that is, uh, you're accurately understanding what, it, what we're uh, suggesting. So uh, I think that's something for us to consider as we think about what's the best strategy to maintain that while also providing uh, the access to that site. There may be maybe this combination of, um, of paths and some broader uh, gathering spaces that people can, can be, um, but, but trying to, to better maintain that, that space. Um, okay, Andrea, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. I think you're all set. You should be able to unmute. Okay. Perfect. Um, so one of my comments is already covered twice about the tall grass. I as I work at the West End House, and and I can tell you, yes, it's a very popular spot. Um, I was wondering, I don't know if this is possible. Could we go back to the slide, the first placemaking slide, where you have the you identify the walls, 
Um, I just want to, thank you, that one, yeah. So when you, the, where it says the low private wall, the red one along Alston Street, um, are you saying that's going to be repaired or replaced or what, or is that just acknowledging that it's there? Yeah, this is not the one along Alston Street. This is on the back side of the other buildings in the yeah. parking area. Yeah, I'm but, talking about the one on Alston Street. Is that it says new entry and pier? So all along Alston Street, you have it looks like you're going to be putting a new wall. Nope, not a new wall. We would repair the existing wall. You know, if the mortar is lost or the capstone's damaged, um, the only thing we do is change the wall at the entrances. Otherwise, we would just repair okay. what's there. Okay. All right. Um, and then. Um, the Gordon Street entrance with the new pathway, um, you know, first of all, I appreciate your inclusion with all the, you know, the pylons and the signs, the Ring of Park Crime Watch has been working hard on that. Um, but that, that one, uh, I mean, and I can tell the, the company that's installing it, I mean, that would, all the, there's a bunch of lights going along that whole pathway that you're, about, you're going to eliminate. And I'm just wondering, I mean, perhaps it's simple that these solar powered light pylons can move. I just was curious if what the timing for that would be just because I don't know, maybe we delay and wait until the new path is there before installing, I'm not sure. So um, we would be relocating those lights okay. as existing features to be relocated to the new pathway alignment. Okay. Uh, that's the park thing we would incorporate that into the, the proposed plan because we don't have a, uh, a timeline for when this is gonna be implemented yet. And we don't wanna prevent that or have to be in a weird space for potentially longer than we had anticipated. So right. that's, that's some of the site costs. The light would get relocated, the existing street light would get relocated, the, the, pile, the entry pylon would get relocated, the, okay. The light pylons would get relocated. I think it might also impact the location of the um, directional signage to the urban wild, but we'll be studying all of that as part of that, that scope of work. All right, that's it, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna allow Nancy to talk and then, oh, I think you're, you should be able to be unmuted. So yeah, Nancy, try unmuting yourself. No. Or Nancy and Bob, it's probably more accurate. Try unmuting yourself again. Is that not working? Okay. Uh, when you are muted, when you have unmuted yourself, just uh, oh, uh, perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Done some interesting work. Uh, good and work. Good work, actually, Nancy. Uh, first of all, I, I sent a question in. Uh, Mr. Zick said the trucks don't drive on the area of, of, above the playing courts, tennis, and basketball. I just saw one there yesterday. They drive there very regularly and ruined the sidewalks that were put in about six years ago, I guess. So they do drive there. I don't know if that's going to change, but just point of fact. I have a question. Does the parks department use rain gardens? You talked about runoff and we see it where it erodes from heavy rains. Could the you know, prudent placement of uh, some rain gardens help that without running it into the storm sewers? Yes. We do use rain gardens, and yeah. um, and yeah. that's definitely something that we'll be considering as we look at, at some of these, specifically the hardscape improvements. Yeah. Um, because we'll need to go through the Boston Water and Sewer review process, and having rain gardens uh, helps us offset the, the impervious surface that we're Good. responsible yeah. for. Um, two in front of the Jackson Man School. They're a couple of years old. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the main hiccup with rain gardens is maintaining them like anything else. Um, they are more maintenance intensive. Uh, oh. We have been somewhat successful in having uh, operational 
funding for contracts in the past, hoping that continues um, as we expand this to more and more sites throughout the city. Yeah. So that is something that we're definitely going to be looking at. Sure. And in some cases, um, what we're looking at for infiltration is sometimes below grade and, and the public doesn't see it, but it's still there and functioning and recharging the groundwater. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one other. Uh, I thought it was impossible, but I think you found probably the one location for a dog park in Ring. Uh, so thank you. And so, um, the final thing is, we have an issue there with skateboarders. As you probably know, skateboarding is not allowed in Ringer Park in just about all Boston parks, unless it's specially designated for that. So if you, you do anything at the circle, it's going to have to have at the Emory Road Circle, hardscapes, those kind of bench things, they would have to be anti-skateboarded, I guess, or whatever it is, uh, system, because it is an issue and they're not allowed for good reason. They're damn noisy. I can walk home from a community meeting when they used to have them in the evenings up the street, uh, two blocks away, I could tell if somebody was in Ringer Park skateboarding. That's unacceptable. We live in the city, we know it, but that kind of noise is not allowed and shouldn't be. Thank you. You're, you're right on top of on top of the space. So it is, it's better for sites that are not immediately adjacent to, yeah. um, Smith so is not it. very close to, 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 uh, to the good at we Smith. do try to, um, to design certain spaces to be accommodating and other spaces to be, uh, have a more defensive, uh, defensive detail so that, that, um, it's less pleasant. Um, that said, it's never 100%. I've seen skateboard marks on all kinds of things where it drives me insane. But because it's 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 not just the noise, it's also leaves marks. Um, so I think that's that's some of the careful detailing that we'll be looking at in a future basis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Marta, and then I'm going to read a couple of uh, read a couple of, of comments and questions. So Marta, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yes, hi, thank you. Thank you for responding to my earlier question. Um, thank you for this presentation. I enjoy how uh, the integrity of the park is, is kind of the same, and uh, but the improvements look really well. I have a few questions, uh, two main questions. First, um, in regards to the playground area, um, is it possible to pull up the slide from the playground, please? So I can see it a little bit more detailed. Um, because there was talk about some, one of the issues there is definitely during the summer, it can be extremely hot. Uh, and so some new trees are very welcome. I, he, on this uh, design, I don't see the existing trees that are at the, um, basically at the side of the stairs. I was wondering, are they going to be removed or will they still be there? No, the existing trees are here. They're just shown fainter, but oh, we're not removing okay. those. Okay, because they are nicely overhanging and they do provide lovely shade in the afternoon. Thank you for clarifying. I, um, and then um, my second question would be in regards to the circle or what would be the motivation for designing even like a square option? Like personally, I feel that's kind of going against the overall feel of the park and I, the flow of the circle, it's just like feels more natural. I mean, my, my child has biked around that a gazillion times, which with a square would kind of not be possible or the corners would be hard to take. Um, so and that's kind of like, like, why is there an alternative for like, what would be the art? I'm sure you have good arguments. So I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good point. We wanted to show that there's different approaches, you know, one that's a little bit more formal with materials that are a little more refined. And then we had one with a circle that had, um, you know, the more rustic materials. And I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, the thing we were trying to do with the rectangle is maybe just, you um, line up with some of the spur paths um, differently. But, you know, I, I think there's no right or wrong, but I think the fact that you have a comment saying that the circle works better, we hear you and we'll record that comment. Right, thank you so much. No, I appreciate the overall uh, thought behind all the design and uh, looking forward to seeing the improvements, especially on the pathways. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question from Christine about uh, will the park lighting for the basketball courts be on year round. Uh, during the fall and winter when the sunset is early, it's hard for kids to play basketball after school. It'd be great to have them on year round. Um, we typically uh, 
have our lights go as a system turn off around, I think it's around Columbus Day, and then we reactivate them in the winter, um, or sorry, in the spring around uh, April. That's for basketball court lights specifically, not interior park lighting uh, on pedestrian paths. Um, and these lights would be on a timer that they would be on um, with a, and they would be on at dusk and then turn off automatically at a, a time that we agreed on. Um, I think the, the thing to, to take home is that this would be new technology. This is not something that we're looking to implement immediately. And the technology is rapidly changing. So by the time we um, are ready to reapproach the community and open up that discussion again, we would have more information about what the cutoffs are, what the um, you know what the light pollution is, how it's going to impact neighbors, and and really be um, thoughtful and considerate about those those issues about you know the impacts to your lifestyle living next to a park. So. Um, Another question from, I'm going in no real particular order here, but maybe I can group some of these together. Um, would woodland paths have some sort of lighting to make it accessible and safe after dark? Um, and I think there was another comment about, um, I don't think we should add lighting to the wooded area to allow for nocturnal nature to have space, um, which is also, that's a, a great point. Um, answer one. Um, and was there another one about the woodland paths? So I do have a question because I, I'm of two minds about the woodland path lighting. Um, one is that um, it's currently a path that people travel and does not feel safe at night. So adding lighting to that makes sense. The other is that it is not the main path and we should discourage people from using it at night uh, and also uh, and encourage them to use the main path. So I'm of, I can see both sides of this. Um, and I, I'm curious about the, the, uh, the community's perception of lighting that path. Uh, Tracy is, I'll allow you to talk. If you have a comment about, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Talk about Hi, that. I, I agree with your second part of that comment because I live on Commonwealth Ave. My I, my right behind me is the woodland path and I have there's owls that live back there and I really don't know if the lighting at night would be good for the wildlife and I think we should encourage people to use the other paths like I've lived here over 20 years and I, I just I wouldn't use that path at night I'd walk the main path I mean I use that path during the day to go to the park so I can get there from the back of my building but I just feel like that we would lose the owl we might lose the owls or some of the wildlife we have lights back there all the time yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, Nancy and Bob, uh, I will allow you to unmute yourself if okay. you Thank you. Have uh, in reference to the court lights, uh, particularly the basketball uh, court lights, we live across from Ringer Park since uh, 1997. If it's summer, spring and fall or a mild winter, which there are many of them, uh, days, there will be basketball players all hours, not big team efforts, probably at night, two or three, sometimes one person. The other night I got up at 2 a.m. I went out on my porch and bouncy, bouncy, there's somebody out there playing dark basketball courts. We put the lights on, uh, there'll be plenty of people there and plenty of issues. I don't think there's they're no necessary. Team. They, no team. And uh, there's no uh, teams play there. They're not, uh, you know, reserved. So I think we can live without the lights. Yeah, so I do, I do wanna acknowledge that we heard from many members of the community that there is a desire to have lighting, lighting there for, for basketball use. Um, so that's, that's why we have included it. It's something that we do provide in other, other uh, neighborhood parks where there are butters uh, as close to you and, and closer. Um, so I will, you know, I, it, it, this is not something we're looking to take an early action on. And I think Bjorn Davis also uh, agrees with you that uh, in opposition to the basketball court laying, for me, the problem isn't 
the light pollution, it's the noise. In the summer, people already continue to play pretty late. And I believe that we abutters deserve peace and quiet at night. So, um, so we hear you, um, but, but we're gonna have to, it's something we're gonna continue to evaluate and, uh, and see where we uh, end up and when that demand becomes something that we cannot, cannot ignore. But it hasn't risen to that level yet, but, but it is, there is a desire for that, that use. That's never 20 years. That's the trouble with these um, six people to make a comment. Uh, Margaret O'Connell agrees with the um, the not including lighting on the perimeter on the woodland path for nature reasons such as the owls and other birds. I prefer to have the urban wild unlit as it currently is. Um, there is a small floodlight in the urban wild, but I think it is probably as inobtrusive as possible that uh, you don't even realize that it's there. Um, Eric Berkland. Uh, I just want to echo does uh, agree with the idea of adding lights to the back basketball courts would be great to use the courts later into the fall, but at a decent hour for Bob. So I think that's that's very considerate. Thank you. Um, Najmina, Najmia, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so um, thank you for the um for the presentation, it's really nice. Um, and so I was wondering if there had been any discussions to put sort of sound dampening panels, because it seems like clearly um, sound is an issue for um, folks and kind of detrimental to the enjoyment of um, younger folks and children that do want to use the playground and the park properly. Yeah, it's something that I've, I've wondered myself because that those courts are um, are bounded by vertical structures. On one side, it's boulders, and on the other, it is a, a concrete wall. Um, whether there's an ability to dampen that noise somewhat, um, there's not a product that I'm aware of right now that would be suitable for boulders and sound sound damp dampening and outdoor use. Uh, you know, I think we all know some indoor use, there's some, some foams you can get, uh, but there's not really something that stands up to the external weather. But um, as this is not something that we're looking to, to make an early action on, perhaps there's something that will become available in time uh, that would be appropriate. So thank you for that comment. Um, Jean Powers also uh, votes for for darkness in the wilderness, uh, fireflies need darkness to find each other. So there's another vote for keeping the woodland area dark. So thank you for that. Um, there were a couple, I think Jean had another question that I wanna to touch on. Are there plans for signage and enforcement about off-leash dogs? This is a huge problem for Ringer as it is throughout the city. Um, so we are uh, working with our animal control unit, which is. Uh, under the Parks Department umbrella now, um, and trying to identify, uh, let neighbors know about the rules around off-leash dogs and some of our more uh, problem parks, which um, is just about in every neighborhood park. So, um, so you're not alone. The, um, so in our conversations with some of the neighbors, we found that they were very considerate and understanding of the fact that they were intruding on the um, on the field use and and tried to be as considerate uh, when there were permit permitted users in that field and they would relocate elsewhere. Um, and that's why we really felt like you know there is a community here that is responsible and um, and may make really good use of that of a dog park. So here, so we wanted to be be sure that we were studying. The viability of putting a dog park here. Unfortunately, it does come down to enforcement and um, and neighbors enforcing the rules uh, because we have limited staff to be in the parks throughout the day and throughout the year um, and really enforcing those rules. So I encourage you to talk to your neighbors, let them know how it affects affects you, and strike up a conversation and try to to work through some of those challenging issues. Uh, I really do think it benefits the neighborhood uh, in general. Uh, Bob, I see your hands up again. So let me un allow you to unmute yourself. You should be good. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Thank you again. Final question, I hope. 
I forgot. Uh, you mentioned signage to the urban wild. Could you on this map on the screen roughly show what the urban wild is and then tell us what it means in the sense of what else, if an area is designated urban wild, I believe it, it's uh, supposed to be uh, maintained in a natural condition with maybe pathways, is that correct? I don't believe this is classified uh, as an urban wild under our urban wilds program. But wait a minute, you say there's a sign gonna point to the urban wild. Well, yeah, there, there is a, a, a directional sign that the uh, Ringer Park Crime Watch has included in their scope of work to point to the, point to the pathways for, and, and they called it an urban wild, but it does not fall into the classification of an urban wild as part of our urban wilds program. Okay, okay. You gotta sign this as urban wild, but there's no one there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Bjorn, Bjorn also had a question, would it be possible to add accessible gates at the entrances to prevent and or dissuade people from bringing in motorcycles and scooters? Yeah. People riding motorcycles and scooters in the park has become a problem and I 100% hear you. Um, limiting that width so that a motorcycle can't get through it, it also limits uh, the accessibility of, of people in wheelchairs and uh, does not meet accessibility requirements that we have. So it's something that is a struggle in many neighborhood parks. Um, and my concern about gates at the perimeter is that they may not be as long lasting as we would hope, but, uh, but it's something that we can consider. And I think we're showing uh, vehicular swing gates. We've also had some, um, in some locations we've installed collapsible bollards that prevent a vehicle from going through there, but, but do allow people to walk around it and are otherwise unobtrusive. So those are some of the things that we'll be looking at in those detail, uh, detail discussions. Um, I think we just that lighting. Okay, so Matt Johnstone, I don't know if he's still here. <laughs> he was one of the first ones to ask a question, but uh, unfortunately it's, we're getting uh, late into the, into the meeting, so I hope he hasn't left. Um, asked what the time frame, estimated construction time frame is, and will the courts still be usable this summer 2021? Absolutely, the courts will still be usable. This, the tennis courts will be usable this summer. Um, I think, as I mentioned, there is no plan for construction at this point. There's no funding for construction. So the park will be open and accessible uh, this summer. You may see some those new lights that are being uh, installed and new directional signage and new uh, entryway signage uh, that the Friends of Ringer or the Ringer Park Crime Watch has been working on. Um, and so that you'll, you may see a little bit of construction related to that, but the rest of the park would be completely functional this summer. Our first step would be to, um, to reapproach the community with design plans about specifically about what phase one is, which is a bit up in the air at the moment, and, and then work through it, another design process, developing construction details, and then putting it out to bid and then starting construction. So we're at least a year away from actually, you know, shovels in the ground and, and being ready to make any changes. Um, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to include design work in the upcoming fiscal year uh, city budget so that we can we can make some progress and, and capitalize on this momentum that we've gotten through this community process. Um, Amy Part Parzik says, I like the fitness trail, dog park, and the rustic placemaking styles. Thank you for that. Um, Case says, very exciting plans. I appreciate how well the community requests were incorporated. I was wondering how and when the work can get started. I think I, I addressed that. Um, but please let me know if you have any other specific questions. Um, Amy also says, the rustic placemaking proposal can be a way to minimize skate skateboarding inclusions. And that's definitely something that uh, to consider as we get into the details. Andrea loves the circle. And um, the circle as opposed to the square uh, is more natural and more flexible for bike riding. And that's a great point as well. 
Um, Jean, a follow-up question from Jean. Can we at least get signage throughout the park about the off-leash dog rule? Asking people to put their dogs on leash doesn't work. It'd be helpful to be able to point to a sign. There should be signs throughout the park as we look at the, um, the park rules signs that dogs must be on leash. Um, and I can see whether we can add some no dogs allowed signs to the, um, to the playground and uh, which is a city ordinance that there's no dogs in playgrounds throughout the city. Um, and put up signs, no dog signs. There may already be no dog signs on the backstop of the Little Lake Field. I do not precisely recall. Um, but I would not expect those to be uh, respected, honestly, frankly. Uh, but I, I, you know, there, there are dogs must be on leash signs at, at the park entrances on the field signs. Um, Najima, I will allow you to unmute yourself. I see your hand is up again. Hi, um, so I'm a mother of an uh, infant and I'm really looking forward to taking him to the playground um, in the near future. Um, I was wondering if there was any plans for the playground specifically to add like a sandbox or something because I've been to other playgrounds near the area that some of them have it like in the Brookline place. So I don't know if that's something that's considered or something that isn't for whatever reason it might be? Um, we tend, I understand that, that sand is, uh, it's a tactile experience and there's a lot of value uh, for kids being able to experience that. We find sandboxes very difficult to maintain um, and they can attract uh, undesired wildlife uh, or not so wildlife pets, um, and uh, and can also collect. They collect a lot of debris and need to be maintained. Uh, not only the sand gets displaced, but it also needs to be maintained and raked out, and that's uh, a lot of work for us. We have found that there there may be some alternate materials uh, and ways of getting that tactile interactive experience through water tables. Um, the life period that, you know, or the, period, the, um, the season of use is diminished, is shorter. It's typically June through Labor Day, um, but it does allow a more interactive uh, experience for kids to be able to turn something on, get water on their hands, play with, you know, toys, dumping things back and forth. Um, so that can sometimes replicate a similar experience. Um, the good news is we have water here. So if we were to, when we study the playground, we can consider whether a water table or some other kind of water feature um, would be appropriate. And it absolutely may be. So I think that's a great, great comment that we'll, great. we'll consider. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Jean, there's some compliments and we really, really love those. Uh, we, will, we will take those back and, and uh, cuddle with them when we go to sleep tonight. So thank you for those. <laughs> uh, I do wanna acknowledge that uh, Morgan Co says that there's no, for, no further comment, but even as a non-basketball player, I definitely, definitely sympathize with the Alston community members wanting to use the courts after school work hours. So we'll just uh, make note of that. Um, uh, uh, Mitch Ryerson climbing structure, it's, it's, it's a long-term goal, Jean. Um, I don't know that we figured out a way to, to get it done, but I think it's definitely um, on the, on the long-term long goal list uh, because he does, does do amazing work that's so unique uh, and really, uh, really interesting. Um, I think these are... Perhaps scheduling the night leagues would be a compromise to allow for use as well as managing the, the neighbor neighborhood concerns. Um, so we, that's something to consider um, when we get to that point. Um, Morgan Co. also asks whether, is there somewhere we can sign up to get updates about this project as things develop? Which is a great, great question. Um, and that was gonna be one of my next, um, my next, there's, I think I, I'll address that pretty quickly. Um, if you have 
left a real uh, email address and or receives an email from me about this meeting, you are on the, on the project mailing list. Um, so that is uh, good news. And we'll be working from that as we start our engagement for the phase one implementation. So, so keep an ear out for that. I'll get more details onto that in a second. Um, Joe Rowland has a question about, is the little triangle on the other side of Gordon Street from Ringer shown on this map part of the park? If so, there are, are there any plans proposals for it at all, as a, including as a potential dog park location? Um, and I wanna make sure that we're uh, exploring the right area. We're pointing to the right area. So, um, little triangle on the other side of Gordon from Ringer. And I think maybe it's that little corner right there. That is maybe the one. To my knowledge, that is not publicly, uh, publicly protected open space. And um, we try to find sites that are at least 5,000 square feet. So I think it would take some investigation to see whether that's a viable dog park location. Um, and, but it is not part of Ringo Park uh, currently. And as far as I know, it's not also in the uh, open space uh, inventory that it could be considered for that. Whether there's an opportunity for, uh, for a developer or another otherwise neighborhood development or uh, community benefit, that's something to keep an eye on and, and talk to, uh, to a neighborhood liaison or uh, your city councilor about as things change. I'm not aware of, of all of the details of the development in this area as some of the neighbors might be. All right, um, I don't see any other hands up and I think we've covered most of the, oh, uh, Nancy and Bob, there was one more question. We agree that the urban wild pathway should remain unlighted. Thank you for the planning you had done, much appreciate it. So thank you. Um, so why don't we, I don't see any more questions and, or comments, no hands up. Um, I think the remaining Q&A are, uh, are mostly general agreement. Um, so why don't we, in regards to the dog park, is there a reason why the patch of green at Gordon Street wasn't selected for the, for the dog park? That's a great question. So in the previous meeting, we looked at several locations. One of those was that was that area, that linear area between the pathway and, and the butters on Gordon Street and High Rock Circle. Um, and we determined that once you back out the, the minimum that we would be comfortable with putting a, uh, a dog park next to the uh, butters and moved the pathway down into that kind of plain area, that you really were left with a very slim uh, leftover area that would not be ideal for, uh, for a dog park. So that was why we considered that space and, and didn't move forward with recommending that. If you wanna see more details of that, it, you can find it on the project website in the meeting two presentation. All right, so why don't we move on to the, the next slide um, where we're talking about next steps. So, um, so we're gonna take all of these comments back and, and consider them as we develop the recommendations for the comprehensive plan development. That's gonna include some rough cost estimating so that we can get a handle on what each of these phases might, might cost um, and and consider that cost along with the priorities that we've discussed tonight. Um, I'm hoping that we will be successful in, in uh, moving forward with phase one pretty shortly. Um, so keep an eye out around the end of the summer. If, if, um, if you hear from me in the early summer, everything's going well and we're gonna be talking about phase one implementation. Um, so, and if you are so inclined, some advocacy with your city councilors uh, would not hurt that process. So, uh, so if you're so inclined, that would be a great, great use of your time. Um, you can visit the project website if you have missed, uh, if you want to go back and see what, how we got to where we are, you can view past presentations and you can also, uh, you'll be able to view this presentation hopefully tomorrow morning when, uh, when that, those 
uh, changes get swept up into and updated. Uh, I'm hoping we will also have the video of this recording up uh, early next week so that, that those who couldn't join us can, uh, can catch up. So please share that link. My contact info is Kathy with a C dot Baker dash Eclipse, all uh, words, regular words at boston.gov. Um, you can email me any comments that you think of later or, or give me a call 617-961-3058 is my work line that gets forwarded to my cell phone. So, um, so I, I answer that throughout the day as, as that rings and, and needs arise. So please contact me if you have any other questions that come up or any other comments that you felt were not properly addressed. Um, I think I addressed all of the questions and comments that came in through the Q&A, but if I did not, I will be working through those and, uh, and, and reach out to you with some details. Um, so if you felt like uh, it didn't properly address you um, or I skipped over something, I accidentally hit the wrong button, I will, I will reach out. I'll please be going through that again. So uh, I think that largely wraps us up. So thank you so much for, for your uh, attention and, and dedication to this park. Um, if there's any 311 requests, maintenance requests, or um, in, in Ringer Park or anywhere else in the neighborhood, 311 is a great resource. You can dial on your cell phone, there's an app, um, or you can go online um, and enter it through uh, the city website at boston.gov and, uh, and keep an eye on the project website and I'll be reaching out as soon as I hear something certain. So thank you so much for attending.